grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you now and always. Amen. I'd like to invite each of you to a little barbecue that I'll be having at my house this Friday. Say about uh, 6 p.m. I'd like to invite you out and we'll have all the festivities and all the fun that normally goes along with it. In fact, we'll be inviting a bunch of important people there to be with us. And so we'll kick off the evening, like I said, about 6 o'clock. We'll start out with the sacrifice of the bull to the false gods. And go ahead and if you're so adventurous, you'll have the opportunity to be splashed with the blood from the bull. Because that will, of course, give you strength. Follow that up with all of us joining together around the picnic tables to eat hunks of this bowl where, if you, just in case you didn't like the blood, you still receive strength from that God. Sound good? Say 6 o'clock? Maybe 5.15 just to be on the safe side. You know, we probably will have a big crowd. A bit of a dilemma for a first century Christian invited to such a barbecue. Now, of course, the first century Christians were not invited to barbecues, but rather actually to temple dining rooms. They literally had in the temple places that after the sacrifice of the animals, you could go and you could enjoy the meat. But this is a dilemma for a first century Christian, isn't it? Because here we have, on one hand, this opportunity to eat, to join together, to eat this meat and, join, and be alongside those who are leaders in our community, those important people, or to put this unclean meat into our bodies, to represent ourselves perhaps in a way that we shouldn't. We have this opportunity to sit down and take in, sit, sitting side by side by pagan priests and community leaders, take in this unclean meat. A little bit of a dilemma. It seems like it should be an open and shut case, doesn't it? Who of us would want to go to a pagan sacrifice? Who of us would want to attend such a meal? Why would we want to go to this? Well, perhaps when you start to think about it, it should be an easy answer. But for these early Christians, they had to keep a number of things in mind. They couldn't just very well say, I'm not going to go because if you did not attend these sacrifices, well, then you made yourself an outcast. You did not make political, business, and social connections you needed to protect the well-being of your family. In fact, you would put your family's well-being in jeopardy if you did not attend these meals. And remember that bowl we mentioned before? Even if you didn't go to the sacrifice, join together in that dining room, you'd still probably be buying the meat in the market. So you'd have to give up, well, pretty much life if you stopped attending these things. But a dilemma, isn't it? Because on the one hand, you want to set a good example. You want to live a life that, that is above reproach, that says to your brothers and sisters in Christ, this is who I am. But on the other hand, you also want to keep up those social, business, political connections that are important for providing for your loved ones. Now for us today, it seems like it'd be easy. Because I don't think any of you are attending pagan sacrifices, right? No one, no one hears. So we don't have to worry about that. But the dilemma is still there, isn't it? Because the dilemma that was facing those early church, that early church in Corinth is still a dilemma that faces each of us today. It is a dilemma of how our actions as brothers and sisters in Christ affect our other brothers and sisters, our family in Christ, those who we go to church with. Now, Paul didn't take this very lightly, did he? I encourage you to turn your bulletin to that epistle lesson, 1 Corinthians 8, and especially look at verse 11 with me for just a moment here. And hear Paul's words, as he, at least how important he thought it was. So this weak brother, for whom Christ died, is destroyed by your knowledge. Paul uses a strong word there, don't you think? That word destroyed. We don't use destroyed for everything. We talk about maybe someone sliding in their faith or someone struggling in their faith, someone wrestling in their faith. But Paul believes this is so important that it could destroy someone's faith. The Greek word he uses is apalumai, apalumai, to make useless, to ruin, to annihilate. See, this is not just a simple matter of eating meat or not. This is not just a simple a matter of being a vegetarian or enjoying pork chops and ribs and steak. Hopefully you're getting hungry for the potluck. No, in fact, this is actually a very serious matter for Paul. Destruction of the faith of a brother in Christ or a sister in Christ.
know, how often do we consider the importance of our own actions? How often do we think about the consequences for not only what we do, but what we say? Think about it in your own life. How often do you think about those people who might be watching? Those people who might hear those words you say? See, sometimes we don't think about those things. Let's take it another direction for just a minute. We'll come back to this. But Paul has such concern for the faith of his fellow believers. Concern that maybe sometimes is absent in the rest of us. We may be willing, which is a good thing, to ask someone where they've been if we haven't seen them in church in a while. But when we see someone on a regular basis, when we see someone pretty often, we don't take time to ask someone, how are you in your faith walk? How is your journey with Christ going? We don't take the time to look at them and ask them those serious questions of where are you? And I think there's a couple reasons for this. First of all, well, a lot of us, even though we know we're surrounded by fellow sinners, yes, we're all sinners here, well, we put on a little bit of a facade. That happy, smiling face. The happy, smiling face that we wear, even when we know there's going to be a difficult medical test in the week ahead. The happy, smiling face that we wear even when we're having family problems, relationship problems. Oh, that happy, smiling face we wear when we're having financial issues or financial struggles. The happy, smiling face we put on when we're wrestling with our faith, when we're wrestling with questions of how God is working through our lives. And I imagine, maybe not right now, but at least at some point in your lives, you've had a time where you've been Put on that happy, smiling face. And we do that because we look around and we see all these other happy, smiling faces. We look around and we think, well, they have it together. He's an elder of the church, so he must have his faith under control. She helps out with everything around church. She cleans the communion glasses. She cleans up after, after, after meals. She must be in touch with God. And so we start to distance ourselves with good excuses, justifications. We start to make, uh, make up reasons that we don't have to be concerned about someone else. And maybe because we don't want someone to ask us how we're doing. Because if someone asks us how we're doing, then they know if we're struggling. They, they, they know if we're wrestling and asking questions of God and asking where He is. They know the difficulties that we have in our lives. Because sadly, not one of us has a perfect life. Not one of us can go through this life and say, everything's great. No, we each have the various burdens that we bear, the various difficulties. And so we try to sweep those things under the rug and put on that smiling face. But as fellow believers, following Paul's examples, we can't make those excuses. We can't just stand there and Assume everything's okay. No, Paul cared. It was literally a matter of spiritual life and death for Paul. Destruction of someone's faith. But even worse is when we, when we are part of that destruction. When we are part of the, those words or those actions that is dr- drive others from the faith. Even worse is when we don't realize it. Because we do it without even thinking. Any of you ever made a mistake? Set a poor example by accident. Said something that you wish you could pull back. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have done things, well, let's put it this way, that do not set a good example as Christians. All of us, sadly, have at one time or another taken part at least in hurting someone else's faith. And we make excuses for this. We say if their faith is so weak, I can't help it. I'm just saying it as it is. I should be able to tell them exactly what I think. And we make those excuses. Maybe we don't do it verbally, but we might think them. We make those excuses on why we don't have to be so concerned with a brother or sister's faith. That's not at all the example that Paul set today in 1 Corinthians. 
that's not at all the example that Christ Jesus said. Because when we look at Christ, we look and we see a man, son of man and son of God, who cared so much that he took time to knew, know the personal aspects of not only his disciples' lives, but those he came into contact with. We have a man who took the time to instruct people, to teach others the promises of salvation in Scripture. But most importantly, we have the example of Christ who saw that it was a matter of spiritual life and death. And so he sacrificed all for us. He gave his whole life even though He lived perfectly for us. For each one of us who has sinned. For each one of us who has lived how we wanted to. Christ Jesus lived. Never breaking the law. Never breaking a command of the Father. And still going to the cross. Becoming the ultimate sacrifice for each one of us. And as His blood dripped down the wood of the cross as it splashed to the earth. He cleansed us and He made us clean. As He gave His life, He gave us life. And He did this out of His great love for us. Out of His tender mercy for each one of us. Not because of what we did, because what we do is so imperfect and so broken, but because of just the abundance of His love. John chapter 15, verse 13. Jesus said, Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And that is exactly what he did. For each one of us, his friends, he laid down his life so that we might have eternal life, so that we might one day join him in, the, in, in salvation. So are we off the hook? Well, yes and no. Yes, because there is nothing we can do to pay for our sins. Nothing that we can do to make up for our mistakes. Because Christ has done it all. But that other side of it, no. Because we are called as Christian men and women to set an example. To live a life that does not cause offense to others. We are given Christian freedom, every freedom, through Christ's death on the cross. But we are given those freedoms with responsibility. The responsibility to love others as much as Christ loved us. And this is a tall order, isn't it? Because we know that even with that responsibility, that we will fail. Even with that call, that we will mess up. But even Paul, who was formerly Saul, who persecuted who, ch who breathed out murder threats on Christians, who will be used by God to spread His love and His mercy, to sh spread His gospel and forgiveness. Even God can use each one of us. No matter how sinful we are or have been, no matter how broken our lives have become or have been, our God can use us because of His great love. His love is everlasting. And so He invites us. He invites us to say alongside Paul, I will give up meat if that will save a weaker brother's soul. Now that would be, obviously, something we probably won't do. But I'm sure when you think of your lives, you can think of things that maybe, maybe sometimes you need to sacrifice for that weaker brother or sister's soul. And so our Lord challenges us. He challenges us to love as He has loved. He challenges us to see how He can use us to bring His love to others. Amen. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we give thanks to You for the freedom we have of being Your children through Christ Jesus' death on the cross. And we pray that each day, we would know the light of Your salvation. We pray that each day we would know the promise of Your forgiveness and the hope of the resurrection. Lord, may You guide us that the words we say, the actions we do, that they may confess You, that they may hold You up, 
as a Savior who loves His people. Lord Jesus, may You guide us that we would be willing to sacrifice our Christian freedoms for the sake of others. Lord, most of all, though, help us each day to celebrate the fact that we are Your friends and that You have shown us the greatest act of love in the cross. And may this be our guiding light. May this be our firm foundation. And may this be the promise that holds us sure until we join you in life eternal. This we pray in Christ Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.